Hello everyone, Chris Grogood. Hope you're well and happy. Uh, this is Bodgkin, who wants to get in on the film. I wanted to reshare this video that I made with Josephine Sellers of Awakening TV in 2013. It's a part of a series of uh, films that she has on YouTube. And i just like to say that um, some of the aspects which I refer to here particularly where I touch on aspects of Cathar spirituality, are being developed by somebody I'd like to recommend called Johnny Bynum, who uh, works in Australia. And he's very centred on the Greening the Laurel. And he's somebody I have great respect for. For those of you who wish to have more information on aspects of Cathar spirituality, which is the core to its, its very essence, um, Please check out Johnny. Uh, he has a number of videos. He has over 100 now on YouTube. They refer to a Cathar Love and then they have a, a corresponding number after that. And uh, he also has a book called The Cathar Dialogue. So uh, I hope you enjoy these and I hope you enjoy this short interview. Thank you. Sellers and I'd like to welcome you to the Awakening TV channel. It's my pleasure today to be interviewing Christopher Grocutt. Christopher is going to give his take on the Cathars, their philosophies, their way of life, their persecution and the legacy they left behind for us today. So welcome Christopher. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. So, um, as I say, this is your personal understanding. Absolutely. There are a lot of different understandings. There are a hell of a lot. So I'm going to start for the benefit of the viewers as to who were the Cathars. The Cathars, um, my understanding of the Cathars is that they were a 11th and 12th into the 13th century spiritual grouping. It would be hard to call them an established church because that's exactly which that they weren't. They were a group of individuals which rapidly spread through southern Europe from the east, from that which is now Bulgaria, through into southern France and particularly the Languedoc, that area just adjacent to the Pyrenees where they really blossomed and something very particular happened there. There were existing forms of spirituality and aspects in that location, but something happened, an alignment in that particular area of what is now, which is now southwest France, which really sparked a particular form of spiritual awakening in these people. It was very gentle, it was very loving, and in many ways very opposite to the usual aspects of medieval life and medieval belief at that time. Okay, so their philosophies really? Were very open and loving. I mean, one could say that an analysis could be they were a amalgamation, an alignment of dualism and Gnosticism. Aspects of thinking and spirituality which had been around for a long time, but over the previous thousand years the established church had, start to, had started to, um, to crush as aspects of belief which didn't sit in with the normal framework of church thinking. So what we have are a group of people spread from um, somewhere in p potentially the Middle East through Bulgaria through into southern uh, France who developed a form of dualism of Gnosticism which was very loving very open very much based on on love and acceptance and not making judgments of other people um, accepting the life force accepting the energy of all living things human animals plants the whole energy of the cosmos. So very holistic. Very holistic, okay. very open, very accepting, very loving. And in many ways, uh, to a rigid society, this was a great threat, particularly to the, the economics and the, the nature of the church at the time. The church needed to control. And so a group of people which are actually saying, don't, don't judge, don't make oaths, be yourself, find your own spiritual path, you come from the light, you go through a, um, a multitude of life experiences, which is very important because of the 
because of the uh, of the element of the belief in, in rebirth, multiple lives, reincarnation, these people were in that alone opposed to the thinking of the established church. They were so indeed. we have this framework which is beginning to build, which is actually building an incredible sort of potential for conflict mm -hmm. because people are, are politically, economically and spiritually challenging the established church. And a lot of their group worshipping or coming together was outside, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Very much so. It was the, the, the Gnostic tradition of the individual finding their own way to a spiritual path. And this very much meant it was not about wealth and power through the built environment. It was very much about nature is the force. Um, and working with those elements and finding an individual way through in that particular environment, just working with nature and understanding that nature and all of the aspects of nature is, is life, force, it's life force itself and also that the animals and the plants are part of the cosmos. Mm. Everything is one. Mm. And so that understanding is when they are in the woods, they are part of the whole. So no dominance, no, no control. No dominance, no control. And quite good equality, male-female, yes. isn't there? Um, the Cathar acceptance of the individual is, is quite unique within Western Europe at the time. Um, quite quickly, the, those who had ascended to a certain acceptance and level of Cathar beliefs were called the Perfecti. These people that were, were, were spiritual, I would hesitate to say spiritual leaders, but they were spiritual guides. They had taken certain commitments not to eat meat, not to commit any acts of violence. And so these were seen by the, the greater population as being guides, inspiration, not in the sense that the church would have power through the priest, the bishop, the cardinal. These people were in spiritually inspirational. And um, this is an aspect which helped the spread of um, that which we call Catharism now. I think it's also interesting to say, to say that Cathar is a term which we now use. They didn't name themselves. Okay. Cathar. They named themselves, they, they strove to be good people. They just called themselves good people. They didn't label themselves. Sounds wonderful. It was, just, <laughs> it was, and it's still an inspiration, and I think it's important to say it is wonderful, not that it was wonderful. It is still a vibration, an aspect which has survived despite the persecution, despite the centuries. It's still with us. It's, it's still, still inherent within it's us in, all. It's, it, it's with us all. And people can reach aspects of Catharism through other belief systems, see humanism, through whatever. Catharism, to me, is a state of mind. Yes, it does have aspects of dualism and Gnosticism, but it's also very much about being in a, a loving, non-confrontational state of mind. Which the world is crying out for today. Oh, Obviously, so. we need to talk about the persecution. It's yes. pretty understandable already why yes. such well, a persecution, but it was very harsh, wasn't it? It was incredibly harsh. Where did um, it come from, Christopher, for the benefit of the viewers? Well, there are, there are several aspects which drive the persecution. As I'd mentioned, mm. that we, we, have, we have an alternate or an alternative to the church developing. Mm. So the church does need to seize back control. The church at the time, by all accounts, include even the Vatican, the Pope himself, is saying that the church is corrupt and was ceasing to work in an appropriate manner. So all vices at the time were saying the church was ceasing to work because of the levels of corruption. So something had to be done because there was a very um, real alternative mm to the, mm. the economic system, which, which was the church, and that still is the church. So um, what we see is Pope Innocent very quickly beginning to um, speak to what we would call the northern lords, certain aspects of the northern French nobility about the potential of a crusade. Um, this through the early part and into the sort of middle of the uh, 13th century, comes to pass, this, pass the crusade moves south 
Vicky's my understanding. I, I mean, in many ways, I'm not an historian, so I think I would say that, that Vicky's my understanding of, of mm. how the Crusade starts. It moves south, and it, ta it starts to besiege very well-established cities in the south. Mm. So you, you have uh, the, the cities of the south, the south being besieged. And at this time, France is not France as we see it now. Languedoc is probably the most cultured and open society in Western Europe. It is a very advanced, very creative society. And the North at that time were far more barbaric and uncultured. Mm. This was a land grab. The Pope saw the opportunity to get the Northern Knights down as a Holy Crusade. Um, the Church saw it as an opportunity to then to shut up Mm. any critics and to make sure that there was no alternative to their, alternative to their, uh, their system. And to the, no the north, it was a bribe. You destroy these people, you'll get land, and land was had. It's France, all about power, it's isn't the it? Birth and control. Of France. It's totally about power, and it's totally about control. And when we, we see the, uh, the crusade move, move south, we, we see an absolute onslaught in a way that Europe didn't see until 1939, mm. because we see a cleansing. And it was not only people that would see or consider themselves a Catholic or even be sympathetic. It could be, you, many of the people that suffered were very devout Roman Catholics. It was an onslaught against the, anyone that could have been, as the church would have seen, tainted by the heresy. And the, the attack was so vicious and so well constructed that it almost depopulated areas, and which are still depopulated. If you look at the amount of cities and towns which were wiped off the map, it was incredible. And not only was this just a form of ethnic cleansing, it was also a form of mass torture, and the cruelties were obscene. We don't know a great amount about the elements of torture. Some of them were documented by the mm. Inquisition. Mm. And, and interestingly, this is the birth of the Inquisition. The, the, the Inquisition w was set up to, um, to deal with the heresy of the Catholics, mm. and it was set up very successfully. And some of the aspects which the Inquisition um, employed were later, it appears, examined by uh, by the SS and the Gestapo was forms of control, and they said this is a stage too far. Even the SS wouldn't do aspects of what these people did, and I think that puts it into a context. But we don't hear much about it in history, we don't. do we? I didn't learn anything of the Cathars in school, did we? No, the victors won, and they've written they've written their, their history for eight hundred years. So what we see is history being rewritten. In many, uh, the only, the documentation, it, it's rather like if we were to look at, if, if uh, the Nazis would have won the Second World War, yeah. and Jewish people would have been eradicated, yeah. historians in future would have said, oh, what are the, I've heard of these people called the Jews, who are they? Mm. The records will be held, oh, we, we, we have got records, the Gestapo, the SS, have their ancient mm. records. We can mm. go back to the mm. Gestapo mm. and we can ask them, here's the records of what the Jews did. Mm. It is that difficult to understand Catharism and the persecution and the crusade because the victors won. They were able to rewrite history mm. and they did it in a terrible and bloody and highly successful way and it's lasted 800 years and only now something has happened which is potentially spiritual, which has allowed something to crack. The facade has fallen away and people are able to see after these many years. And Why also, do you think that is, Christopher? I think it is in alignment of where society is. Mm. I think we are able to talk about things, particularly in the West, mm. as, and understand aspects of spirituality and the potential of spirituality, multiple lives, mm. um, how animals and people operate, mm. how, we, how we exist in the great cosmic cycle. 
which in the West wasn't there. Because the church won, because the church closed this down, this was not available. But now we are in a society which is able to take aspects of inspiration from many other beliefs and many other sources. Mm. And so this is part of the, a more general alignment of, of openness. I'm going to jump questions and bring one up right from the bottom of my list about the greening of the laurel. Ah. Because this is really what we're talking about, isn't it? Very much so. The greening of the laurel. My interpretation of the greening of the laurel is that the long winter has passed. The spring is here. The laurel is re-greening. The, the, the laurel did not die. It slept through a long mm. winter. But the, it is now opening through a myriad forms mm. of not only spirituality, but the way that people can understand they can operate alongside one another. Mm. It's a social political thing mm. too. We can mm. now understand that we don't have to hate and control. We can begin to work together through mm. processes. This then comes in alignment of potential spirituality and this means that the laurel can green and is greening. It's not, it's not, it's not a plant, it's not a, a thing which is dead. No. The laurel is alive. It is the same laurel, the same energies, the same forces that were persecuted in the mid-13th century. And that's still with us. Yes. If anything, it's, it's stronger. So if people were to feel depressed, sad, pulled down by the idea of, of the person who's persecution of the Cathars, I would say maybe it was meant to be. We are where we are. The Cathars have not gone anywhere. In fact, without realising it, the Cathars are stronger now from ever. Mm. And it's not something we, we talk about in the past context. Catharism is real and it has an energy now within all of us. And we're back. And, we're and, back. And it's in us all. And, and we do read m many cases back to Arthur Gurdon, who met so many uh, of his clients. He was yes. a psychotherapist. A psych uh, no, he was a... Psychiatric. Psychiatric. Um, yeah. can't, yes. We can't remember the term yes. at the moment. Yeah, he, Psychiatrist. He, Psychiatrist, And of he course, yes, encountered many people in the bath area with samskara, didn't he, to do with yes, the burning at Monsignor. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, Gurdon books were important because they began to document the possibility of former lives. And, mm. and they were some of the first books which looked at finding forms of evidence for mm. past life existence. Mm. Mm. Um, there were a series of books, the Cathars and Reincarnation, were a, was, a, was the book that was first drawn mm -hmm. to my attention. Um, and in that book, he documents several people. He then writes other books talking about uh, aspects of uh, Cathar spirituality, which he worked through a, a, a sort of a channeled approach yes. to it. Yes. But I know, Christopher, that uh, you have a, a, an affinity or a feeling of a personal connection to the Cathars. Very much so. Um, Why is that? What is it? In how uh, does it come to you? I don't know. I know I'm strongly connected to them. The energy of the Cathars do, does sit within my heart. I don't know what it is. Sounds like it does when you talk. It does. <laughs> I feel it. Um, I ignored it for much of my adult life and only several years ago did it blossom. But when it came through, it came through like a nuclear explosion. Um, Wonderful. And it, it just blew everything away and it just made sense. I saw the world in a very different way. That's um, I think that for me, it is something which I, I'm either linked to, I'm not saying it is or isn't former life. I don't know. The potential is there. Mm -hmm. However, I just know that there's a very strong, in my own life, it's a very, very strong calling. And I know other people, and I'm increasingly meeting other people, and this is a very strong calling, and it's a very, very positive aspect on their lives. Mm -hmm. It's making them much more, much more gentle, less judgmental people. Mm -hmm. And you've been to Monsignor. Tell me what it's like I to have. go there. Monsignor is a place which one expects it to be, but different. We need to probably, for the viewers, just say what happened there. Ah, yes. Monsago was the was a, 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 a castle, a stronghold, which was built as the crusade began to build up, or the potential of a crusade began to build. Um, a fortification was built on a, on a very ancient spot on a mountain in southwest France, in a, in a relatively remote part of the Pyrenees, but in a safe Cathar area. And there were 
a number of Cathar nobility who were able to put money into the strengthening of this existing fortification. Mm. It was a very difficult spot to besiege and it became a centre of Cathar life. Um, it was a very practical spot because it meant that the organisation of, of aspects of Cathar society were being organised and there, the building of um, early hospices and um, training and all kinds of aspects relating to the Catharism, including the workshops. Cathars were very um, linked to craft-based works. The, the, the working with the hand was very important, weaving, etc. Mm -hmm. So they began to train people in forms of craft. Because the, the Languedoc was also a highly crafted area. It had a, a, a great deal of um, artisans and craftsmen that were able to make really quite exquisite things. And they built on this, but they built in aspects of spirituality. So um, the, the castle itself is there, and underneath you, you, there's still the remainder of the houses where the workmen... Are, and also some women who were working, as far as I understand, because this was an open society. People were training and uh, living there. So it, was a very, it wasn't just a, a, a castle as maybe we'd understand it. It was a spiritual centre for reflection, um, conversation, but also training people through very practical skills related to uh, craft. So when the Inquisition came, what happened at Monsignor? It was a place where the, 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 the prefecti, those who were, remained absolutely true to the faith, were called to. They, As they, the Inquisition advanced? Yes, in the final stages, it was the last bastion of the belief. And so they who went were the, the there were several Cathar bishops, um, and they had um, staff or, or clerics. Or, or, it's very hard because they, they, they use different words that we would use. They, they had people they worked with, and the, these groupings would go, and the prefecti, and, and people that were very involved, some nobility involved with. Um, with the Cathar belief system, fled to Montsegur. For safety? For safety. And then it was besieged. Oh. And for months it was held out, but finally the hour came. It was just, it was inevitable and it was, the defence was broken. Um, there were, there is, it is believed that certain aspects were uh, taken from, the, from Montsegur, which were probably sacred text. For Not, safety? Yeah, for safety. I mean, there, are, there have been rumours of treasure, but the, the, the Cathars being duelists were, were really unconcerned by wealth. Mm. Physical wealth did not concern them. It was useful because it allowed them to build hospitals and, and, do, mm. and buy bread and give that to the needy. So it was useful, but it was not important. So treasure to the Cathars mm. was something which was much more spiritual. So something did, was taken out of Prior ago. to the yes. annihilation that went on there. And then there was a two-week window between the surrender and the execution. The day of the execution, um, a choice was given to all inside the castle. Do you want to sort of renounce Catholicism and return to the fold of the church? Or stay. Or stay. But there also there were mercenaries, there were other people. So there were, it wasn't just a Cathar yeah. community in there. So the... The uh, soldiers, many of the mercenaries, would have been Catholic. They would have gone back. They would have yeah, said, we, "We're not." So they were the, the the mercenaries, for instance, were allowed to leave with their arms, um, and then the remainder, those who would not renounce the truth, were heretic. So they were led down to a stockade at the bottom of the castle. Um, what happens? The castle is quite high. Around it has uh, there's a small path, which any, anyone who goes now will still follow the same path. It's a beautiful path. It's very steep. It has lizards over, and it's very it, it sort of hums with insects. It, it's very it's a very very beautiful spot. At the bottom is a meadow. In the in uh, in the meadow, a stockade was built, and all of those who would not renounce Catholicism were corralled into there and the stockade was set on fire. But there was a very interesting point, and this is, this is chronicled by the church and all who saw this. Despite the hundred and so people that were in there, I think it was around 150 people were in there and, and burnt alive, 
Not one person screamed. Mm. There was no sign, including children. Mm. There were men, women and children. There was, there was no sign of panic. panic, pain or fear. Something happened in there which completely threw the church, because they know if you set fire to someone, they scream. But something happened and not one person appeared to scream. There was some form of transcendent, transcendent mm. which is very important to months ago. And I think that's what polls people, despite the act being so violent and so horrible, something happened which, was, which allowed those people in some way to transcend. Mm. So it was a horrible event, but something very particular happened. Mm. And the church couldn't explain it. No one who saw that execution could explain what happened in that day. And that's clearly documented in the record of the Church and the Inquisition. So it's a hugely mystical yes. thing that's happened. And it's I a suppose terrible, the horrible energy event. is still there. Yes. Of mysticism, would you say? What is the atmosphere, would you say, when you were... I would say it has, despite... What's gone on there? What's gone on, it has a very beautiful, loving, calm environment. It feels... Easy. It was their home, wasn't it? It was their home. Yes. And whatever's there is very calm, very beautiful, and very, very inspiring. And very beautiful to look at. Yes. Picturesque and unbelievable. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, the views from uh, the Mount itself across the valleys are exquisite. It mm. is very beautiful, particularly in the late spring. Last when I was there, it was May. Mm. An exquisite, very, very green landscape, much greener than I expected. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the Cathar Caves. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Because is this not possibly where some of the... Yes. The Cathars used caves for, for, for forms of spiritual growth and meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a series of caves which were times seven. There were seven caves. My wife I, and Anne um, organised a visit first to people that knew the caves and mm. knew from a, a, a spiritual mm. position, so we'd organised mm. a visit. And when you go into the caves, the first cave can be entered easily, the others you do have to go in as um, a pothole, you, you have to go mm. in cave equipment, mm. it's just, mm. you just do, it's a very difficult cave system. Well, it's to get into uh, as a non-caver. Mm. Um, I was able to enter the first, second, third and fourth cave. Mm. But because I have problems with arthritis and other mm. problems re related to my legs, I couldn't mm. get any further. Mm. Um, my wife uh, Anne and the guides went into the inner chamber. Mm. And they, they do, a, 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 the theory is they represent the chakras too. So you're going further and further in. And the energy just changes in each cave. Um, and there is an amazing atmosphere in there. I came back into the outer cave, which is which is a, a ledge on a precipice, which you can only enter by the cave. So it's a really un. It's a very. People have never really gone to this space very much, and I was able to meditate mm -hmm. and just be there while my wife was mm -hmm. going into the inner parts of the caves, um, which was an amazing experience. While you're talking about that, I want to talk about the Cathar hymn. Lubuvia. Ah, yes. Because that sounds the sort of place where you might hear it and yes, about that. Yes, internally. Because there's something that's quite... S I've heard it and it's yes, remarkable, well, but is there not some encoding they feel? Yes, there is. Um, it's on YouTube. Yeah. I came across this accidentally. Um, it's by a person called um, Hans André Stam. Mm. Lubuvia, mm. the cattle herder. Yes. It seems that this is a particular Cathar hymn which was translated later so it could survive. Nothing associated to the heresy was allowed to survive. But if anyone were to, to go onto YouTube and, and just do a search for the Cathar hymn mm -hmm. or the Bouvier, it is a very particular song and for me it has an incredible resonance. I mean, Intuitively, I have no evidence for this, but intuitively, um, I believe it has some link to the Consolamentium, which is the Cathar um, point of acceptance. It's, very, it's the ultimate Cathar um, ritual. Cathars weren't into rituals, but this one, the Consolamentum, was a very particular point of acceptance. Acceptance, love of the self, through the love of the self, love of the whole cosmos. 
and then acceptance that everything is one. Well, it's very beautiful. It's extremely so, haunting, it is isn't it? It is an incredible song, and I think anyone watching this is film well should worth to listen really to. go and listen to this and just be with yourself. You, do, you can either meditate with it or just be with this song because it has an incredible resonance for anyone I have introduced this to, saying that's amazing. It really internally does something very strong so to So although it's just about the cattle herder and his... Yes, Life. there's something there's within something the beneath tune, it. There's, there's something beneath something's it. Something's going on, isn't there? There's a frequency, there's something happening in that sound which has got... For me, it felt like remembrance. Like, absolutely. It's reminding and us all. That's the word that so many people use. But whatever it is, it is very important. Yes. And, and I think it's something that, that people go away and they see this film. I think just, just go onto YouTube and, and have a look for... I think the best way of doing it as a, as a YouTube search is just by the Cathar Hymn. The Cathar Hymn, comes up. that comes up. Yeah, as the yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I think I've asked you all the questions I wanted to ask you. It's been very interesting, very enlightening, very um, passionate. Thank Something you. Something comes through when you talk about this. And uh, uh, and it's. I think it's it's good news for the time we live in, because I, I think, you know, across the world, and particularly in Western culture, Yes. We are remembering and waking up. We are remembering. And of course, that's what this TV yeah. channel's about. Absolutely. So thank but you very much for coming all the way here today, thank you. Christopher. Thank you and, very much. Uh, I'd like to say to the viewers, if you've liked what we've brought you today, um, please maybe subscribe to our channel, like us on Facebook and follow us, because we just want to be part of this wonderful, I'm going to say greening of the laurel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you.